Friends, colleagues, uh, welcome to the first director lecture series for the academic year 23-24. My name is Adam Habib, and I am director of SOAS. Uh, our theme today is the political weaponization of religion. Uh, you know, if you looked and thought about this challenge 50 years ago, all of us would have held the view that religion uh, and religious polit the political weaponization of religion is eroding around the world. And as we have the emergence of modernity, as we have development, so too the challenge of religion and people being politically uh, weaponized by religious identities will be something of the past. We know over the last 10, 15, 20 years that this is not true. You're seeing the tragic consequences of the political weaponization of religion in the Middle East and in Israel and Palestine today. And you see it in so many other parts of the world. It is a feature of developments in the United States, as we have seen over the last 10, 15, 20 years. You're seeing it in places like Australia, uh, even it has its own manifestations in Western Europe. But we also see it in the Middle East. We see it playing itself out in India and in Pakistan and in Bangladesh and in so many other parts of the world. And so the question that emerges is what is going on? Why this political weaponization of religion? What are its consequences for the challenge that we confront as a global community? You know, we live in a time where all of our challenges are transnational in character, climate change, pandemics, inequality, renewable energy, all of these are the global challenges of our time. And if we are going to succeed in addressing these challenges, we need to cohere as a human community. But is that possible with the political weaponization of religion? We today seem more polarized than ever. In some analyses, our polarities are as deep as existed in the global community prior to World War, World War I and II. And so this is perhaps one of the big fundamental questions of our time. And so we're going to ask, we've invited two colleagues from very, very different parts of the world with very, very different types of expertise to help us understand why do we have these challenges around the weaponization of religious identities? What form does it take? Or is it similar in different parts of the world? And what does it mean for the possibilities of cohering the human community to address the challenges of our time? Our two speakers, we have Shazad Hamid Ahmed and Josh Rusta. Shazad is a Pakistani freelance journalist an award-winning documentary filmmaker. His work has ranged from filming with a white militia in the US, investigating Mumbai attacks mastermind, masterminded by Hafiz Saeed's Lashkar e Taiba and ISIS recruiters in Marawi, exposing Nepali children marri child marriages, illegal gold, gold mining in Brazil's Amazon forests, filming underwater, to investigate the Great Barrier Reefs, bleaching, and many, many other stories in Afghanistan, Indonesia, and Philippines. Shazad's documentaries have been broadcast in Al Jazeera, TV, F International, Toggle, Down News. He received the Prince of Austria's Award for International Cooperation from the King of Spain in 2014. Uh, his video, Pakistani filmmaker Shazad Amid Ahmed receives the Prince of Asturias Award from the King of Spain in a particular period. So Shazad is a Fulbright scholar with masters in news and documentary from New York University. He has won 10 world medals at New York festivals, three global media awards in Germany and the Green Image Award in Japan, two silver awards handled climate change festival in China uh, and Singapore's Media Cop News Award of the Year in 2015. You can see we've got an incredibly accomplished documentary maker in, in Shazad. Our second speaker 
is of course Joss Ruiz, political sociologist and associate professor of politics at the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization at Deakin University in Melbourne. And he is an internationally recognized authority on the role of masculinities in violent extremism and terrorism and the attraction of men to Salafi, jihadist, far-right, and anti-democratic movements. His research focuses on the intersection of politics, sociology, law, and religion, and has advised state governments and the federal government in Australia. And he has spoken in a number of key international forums uh, around the world. Dr. Roos is currently chief investigator on an, on an Australian Research Council funded study on the far right, intellectuals, masculinity, and citizenship. And he's the lead chief investigator of the ARC funded project, Anti-Women Online Movements, Pathways and Patterns of Participation. He has authored books uh, on masculinity and violent extremism, the new demagogues, religion, masculinity, and the new populism and political Islam and masculinity. His latest book, co-edited with colleagues, is titled Security, Religion, and the Rule of Law. So again, we've got two colleagues who are going to make help us understand this incredible challenge of the weaponization of religious and identities and what it means for the modern world. So I'm going to kick off with Shazad. Uh, I'm going to call you in. The floor is yours uh, for the next 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adam, for having me on this talk. Um, I'll focus my comments on my three-part documentary series called In Bad Faith. Uh, we went on a journey to film the weaponization of religion um, across Asia to understand the links between populist nationalism, religion, and the use of violence uh, for political gain. And we filmed with some notorious religious-based uh, political groups with aggressively nationalistic objectives. Uh, number one, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh in India, the Islamic Defenders Front in Indonesia, and the Tariqat Labbaik in Pakistan. And in the end, in Sri Lanka, we got to film with Buddhist extremist outfit, the Bodhu Balasena, to investigate their strategies, uh, their motivations, and the impact they are having on their respective societies. Uh, the part one focused of course, on the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which is a right-wing paramilitary volunteer organization that aims to create a Hindu Rashtra, a subcontinent only for the Hindus, uh, from supporting cow vigilante groups in Rajasthan, attacking Muslim cattle traders, to spreading Islamophobia across RSS-backed television status, stations. We attempted to understand how India's secular fabric, uh, originating from the idea of of ideals of Gandhi uh, is slowly eroding with the rise of Narendra Modi and the BJP after uh, 2014. And we wanted to understand the ideological connections between the RSS and the BJP, which are ruling India for the last nine years. And as we know, Narendra Modi is a lifelong RSS member who completely believes in the creation of a Hindu Rashtra. And this sort of philosophy dates back to 1938, uh, when the chief of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, Madhav Sadashiv Golwalkar, uh, who was inspired by the, uh, the ideals of Adolf Hitler's theory of Aryan supremacy, uh, wrote his book, We Are Nationhood Defined, and where I quote, and he mentions, the foreign races in Hindustan must either adopt the Hindu culture or language and must lose their separate existence or merge into the Hindu race or may stay in the country wholly subordinated to the Hindu nation, claiming nothing, not even citizens' rights. So now we have a better understanding of why India is heading towards this weaponization of Hinduism or what normally people call it Hindutva. The impact of what's happening in India is falling on every single fabric of Indian society. Sweden's We Dem Institute now calls India the world's biggest electoral autocracy. And as most autocracies clamp down on free speech, India today is no different. 
It is ranked as one of the worst places to be a journalist. According to Reporters Without Borders, India has slipped to 161st first position out of 180 countries in the 2023 World Freedom Press Index. Journalists who remotely question the powers that be in India are harassed. Only a few, be few weeks back, more than 45 journalists in New Delhi were picked up and questioned for allegedly taking money from the Chinese government and propagating their propaganda. Intellectuals like Arundhati Roy, who once stood for the consciousness of Indian society, are facing jail time, while people like Pragya Singh Thakur, who have terror charges for bombing Muslim places of worship, are elected to the parliament and given respect and honor. I got to film with a right-wing Hindutva TV ch channel called Sudarshan News that has been free for the last many years to demonize and otherize Indian Muslims. We filmed with its editor-in-chief, Su Suresh Chavhanke, who routinely uses morphed images of Muslims peeing in mandirs or raping Hindu girls, broadcasting conspiracy theories like Love Jihad, with the, the idea that Muslim men are luring Hindu women into marriages and converting them to Muslims. This particular guy has more than 1,800 first information police reports against him, and he has not once seen uh, a jail for what he has done to the Indian society. So the media, and with that, social media has created such polarization in Indian society that you have lynch mobs that are ro roaming the streets of Uttar Pradesh today uh, with uh, believing that these conspiracy theories are correct. Surprisingly, even Afghanistan, where the Taliban government is known to restrict independent journalism, has a better ranking than India today. And that is what the price people are paying for voting in uh, the weaponized version of Hindutva or Hinduism in India. Part two of our, our documentary series focused uh, or was called The Battle Within Islam. And we got to film in Indonesia and Pakistan. And we understood the kind of history that the region has seen and how the CIA and Saudi Arabia funded the weaponization of Islam. We also understood that they were the kind of books uh, there were jihadi books that were pub published, funded by the CIA, and they were uh, written down in the University of Nebraska, and then smuggled across to Pakistan and Afghanistan during the 80s, had a massive impact on weaponizing Islam and Afghan Pakistani society. And uh, many parts of Pakistan today continue to pay the price, and Afghan society as well, of how this geopolitical fight transformed into a fight between capitalism and communism and how the secular Sufi Islam that once was the mainstream religion in Pakistan and Afghanistan was replaced by a radicalized insular version of Salafism, which continues to be the guiding philosophy behind the Taliban today and how they don't believe in women's rights and girls' education. Till today, it is on the tongue of every jihadist who operates in the Pakistan and Afghanistan region, uh, where uh, they regurgitate the same propaganda that was given to them in, uh, in Pashto language many, many years ago. And uh, the offshoots like of these groups like the tariq -e taliban Pakistan or ISIS continue to bomb seminaries, which were once uh, the mainstream Barelvi Islam. And now they're under threat from this Salafism. So we've seen how uh, a weaponized version of Islam was used to divide Afghan and Pakistani society for the greater objectives of fighting communism. And that spillover effect has gone to every part of the world. We had fighters coming in from Indonesia, Malaysia, who operated and uh, were housed in places near Peshawar, where they got this, these trainings. And once the war was over, they went back to all their respective countries, including in Ind Indonesia, where we got to film with the, the Islamic Defenders Front, who have now transformed and morphed into activists fighting against blasphemy uh, accusations against minority groups, Christian minorities in Indonesia. We also got to film with the uh, Tariq e Bank, uh, which is also uh, using the blasphemy laws and weaponized blasphemy laws under General Ziaul Haq. 
and how they are being used to hound Christian minorities in Pakistan. Just in 2020, we had about 200 cases that were reg registered against the Christian minority in Punjab province. We saw Salman Taseer assassinated. So that's the spillover effect of a weaponized form of Islam that we saw that was distributed and promoted in this region. And the third part of his documentary series was filmed across Sri Lanka called Inside Milton Buddhism, where we investigated how these historical conversion of Buddhist strongholds like Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Indonesia, uh, where, where this history was weaponized for political forces, by political forces, and how groups like the Bodhu Balasena or the Buddhist force were propped up by the Rajapakshas in, in, in the last many years of power. And they were deployed against the Tamil minorities and the Sri Lankan Muslims. And eventually this crumbling down of society led to ISIS using these fragmented pieces of society for their own good. And we saw the Easter Sunday bombing. So we were able to track how they use social media to create disinformation against Muslim groups, morphing images. So these deep divisions continue uh, to haunt Sri Lanka today. And as a result, the country has collapsed from within and they are literally reeling on foreign aid. And um, I'll end my statement by stating that most countries around the world are staring down a dark path where religious divisions are getting worse due to the polit politics of hate and disinformation. Social media and the dark world has been weaponized, uh, transforming once secular societies into lynch mobs on the street and where coexistence has become uh, much more difficult. Um, I'll end my initial comments here and thank you and back to you, Adam. Well, thanks you, uh, Shazad. I'm going to go immediately to uh, Dr. J uh, Josh, Josh Ruiz. Uh, Josh, um, you know, Shazad speaks about a particular part of the world. He speaks, of course, about Sri Lanka, India, and Pakistan. Your research and work around the weaponization of religion and religious extremism and how that gets politicized is in a completely different part of the world and has a sense and takes and has very, very different political dynamics. Would you, would you take the floor on, um, for the next 15, 20 minutes? Yeah, thanks so much, Adam, for the uh, invitation to be here today. Uh, look, before I start, I just do want to acknowledge that I'm sitting here on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respect to their elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. And that's particularly uh, pertinent and, and relevant in the context of our voice um, referendum this Saturday. Uh, we've actually got a major um, referendum going to our people uh, as to whether or not Australia recognises Indigenous um, Australians in our constitution and establish a formal voice to parliament. And so it's a, it's a really tumultuous time here and, and many religious actors, um, particularly to the right of politics, are actually opposing that voice. So there's, there's a lot going on in this context over here. So my aim here today is just to talk about and to take us over the contemporary uh, theoretical debates around the political weaponization of religion, and, and namely the notion that religion has been hijacked by populists, and we could add to this extremists. I'll explore how long subordinated religious actors are teaming up with populists and demagogues to reinvigorate a project of empire building uh, in countries including Russia, Turkey, India, but primarily the United States and, and, and many Australian um, uh, actors particularly seek to replicate what's going on in the US. Um, and I'm really concerned about the potential re-election of Trump um, and, his, and his relationship with Christian nationalism. So I'd also like to use the opportunity here to be a little bit imaginative and play out some current patterns to their logical conclusion over the next decade. Uh, and in particular, the potential for Christian nationalism to lead to a reordering of US and wider Western societies and how that might relate to the re-emergence of religion-based empires seeking to reshape the global order. So one of the more, and I, I should say, most of my work um, for the last uh, 10 to 15 years has been um, focused primarily on Muslim communities in Western contexts. And it goes without saying that the political weaponization of religion there um, has, has caused catastrophic damage um, to our um, both social cohesion, uh, but also our harmony as a nation 
And it's only now that Australia is starting to reconcile that with a far more balanced coverage, for example, of the um, Israel-Palestine conflict. So looking to hijacking religion, um, one of the more important books in, in the politics and religion space in recent years has been was titled Saving the People, How Populists Hijack Religion. And that was a collection edited by uh, Mizuki, McDonnell and Wah. And it explores how right-wing political parties have used religion to define the us and them that are so central to the polarisation upon which populist actors are thriving. And Olivia Wah argues that for populists, religion takes on the role of an identity marker rather than belief. As a national identity, he argues, Christianity is thin and can be easily hijacked. Rogers Brubaker has subsequently defined the term identitarian Christianism, which adopts a secularist posture and an ostensibly liberal defence of gender equality, gay rights, freedom of speech. In other words, it's not really Christian. For, him, for Brubaker, Christianity is embraced not as a religion, but as a civilizational identity understood in antithetical opposition to Islam. Other work, including that by DeHannis and Sheraton, goes a little bit further, asserting that religion is part of popular style with religious symbols, tropes, feeling of belonging, difference and entitlement being selectively used by populist politicians. So here the populist instrumentalization of religion rather than religious extremism per se, is framed as one of the major issues facing Western democracies. Christian faith and religion framed uh, by both sides as inherently peaceful and beyond reproach. However, for myself, um, my, my grandfather was a, a Pentecostal minister. I grew up, um, in that environment and, and intuitively that didn't necessarily stick right with me um, and so I'm, I was interested in exploring that in a little bit further in, in some of my research. So religion plays a critical role in our society and faith-based conceptions of morality have shaped the laws we live by and practice to this day including in avowedly secular nations. Much of our intellectual process, progress including um, the development of the sciences have been driven by faith-based imperatives uh, as humans from religious traditions across the spectrum have sought to understand the divine and, and to become closer to the divine. Irrespective of the secular context, our universities, in some cases a majority of scholars, inspired by their faith, have sought to pursue scientific truth. Faith has equipped humans to transcend tribal and racial boundaries, working together through their love of God to build a future grounded in common humanity. And we've seen faith-based, unfortunately, faith-based communities securitized punished and brutalized, subjected to genocide, holocaust and annihilation for their religious beliefs and practices. We've seen uh, too many incidents throughout history where powerful demagogues and populists, not to mention extremists, have contested this power, have cloaked themselves in faith to justify wars of conquest and atrocity. Yet we also have to look at the, other, the flip side of this and the internal contestation within religion. Even uh, within Christianity, there are many factions, both within the Catholic Church, within the Pentecostal movement. There's an incredible diversity that in secular countries and, and nations is often cloaked and behind the scenes. And, and the notion that um, I would argue, the notion that religion has been hijacked, in particular in relation to Christianity, overlooks the mutually beneficial relationship between Christian religious actors, in particular, who enjoy structural security, privilege, enormous wealth of, in, in terms of the assets of the churches and so on, and, and, and that relationship with demagogues as they work together to regain a power that they believe that they have lost. And this is a relationship in which religious actors draw upon their status, economic strength, institutional connections and power to support those uh, populist leaders who are advocating for them. And I'd argue it's very clear that we're now seeing, perhaps more than ever, textualist faith leaders clearly aligning with uh, powerful populists and demagogues. So where do we see this? I mean, globally, there are significant issues and it was really well articulated in the Indian context um, by Shazad. Um, but Russia, uh, we're seeing Putin align with the Orthodox Church. He's made faith central to the rehabilitation of Russian masculinity and empire. He's brought the Russian Orthodox Church in from a, a century out in the wilderness. He's embraced that Christianity as a key element of a new uh, national ideology, uh, so utilising it to contribute to what uh, Payne has called Russia's spiritual security. And so for Putin, the Orthodox Church, with its emphasis on traditional values, fills an ideological void created by the decline and collapse of Soviet communism, but also safeguards against the proselytization of evangelical churches in, um, in Russia. 
to Turkey, the, um, where Erdogan and the AK party uh, has, has teamed up with conservative Islamist leaders. Faith has been central to the reassertion, I should say, of Turkey and the Ottoman Empire. And, and, and Erdogan has adopted an imperial foreign policy that aligns with Turkey's Ottoman Empire past. He sought to achieve great power status and continues to do so. I don't need to go into India in too much detail, other than to say that faith has uh, become central to the reclamation of India from the world's largest Muslim minority and the desire to make India a great power. And a case in point is the new parliamentary building, which erases representations of Islamic culture and, um, and, and has been framed as undoing the colonial mindset, but it's a building by Hindus for Hindus. And the reclamation of the name Bharat, uh, excuse me, enunciation, a, a Sanskrit term referring to a period of Indian empire. In Europe, we've seen the Law and Justice Party in, in, uh, in Poland. In Italy, Giorgio Maloney from the Brothers of Italy uh, Party has talked about defending God, family and nation. In Hungary, Viktor Orban uh, from Fidesz Party has talked about becoming a defender of Christian values. Now, it's easy to see them as cloaking themselves in religion, all aligned with Catholic conservatives who have repeatedly attempted to oust the Pope Francis, uh, even engaging with Steve Bannon in an attempt to do so. And given the significant theological and political shifts that have occurred since Pope Francis took on the role, it's no surprise that he's made powerful enemies. And, and I, I cover off that in my book, The New Demagogues. So turning to the US, where I'm particularly concerned about uh, the current trajectory, particularly as we approach the uh, 2024 presidential campaign, uh, I'm worried about that relationship between white Pentecostals, um, but also um, uh, Protestants uh, and, and Catholics in the US, um, and the, their backing and their strong support for, for Donald Trump. Uh, and to a lesser extent, Ron DeSantis, in case Trump doesn't actually uh, make it to the uh, election. And Australia has just had for a number of years a Pentecostal Prime Minister who's also been pushing um, an agenda, but also weaponised religion and faith um, in, in many respects. 75% of white evangelicals voted for Trump in 2020, down from 81%. Uh, but this compares to 57% for Trump and 42% of Biden amongst white Catholics in that last election. But a July 2023 New York Times poll explored Republican voter attitudes to Biden and Trump based on demographic features. It found that 78% um, of uh, Catholics and Protestants, and 77% of um, Catholics, I should say, held favourable views of Trump. 81% of white evangelicals held a very favourable view. Other factors included no college income, uh, no college and low income. But importantly, 94% of white evangelicals held unfavourable views of Joe Biden. So in this context, where this voter base has played a critical role in the election, and dare I say, possible re-election of Donald Trump, uh, he's, he's managed to secure a religious right um, significant wins by changing the composition of the Supreme Court, by securing the repeal of Roe and, uh, Roe and Wade, um, and, and basically that outlaw that made abortion legal. Tactics have included becoming highly active in political parties. I'm, we're talking here about Pentecostals. And, and seeking to control um, court appointments, um, he's offered them a reach and influence far disproportionate to their percentage in the wider community. We're only talking about 10% of, of Americans. And these often intersect with far-right political discourse. In their work examining Christian nationalism, Gorski and uh, Perry outline the deep story of Christian nationalism that sits central to the white evangelical Christian narrative. And that's important here because um, they, they state that in this narrative, America was founded as a Christian nation by white men who were traditional Christians based on the nation's founding documents and Christian principles. The United States is blessed by God, which is why it was successful and has a special role to play in God's plan for humanity. The heroes in this myth, according to Gorski and Perry, Perry are white conservative Christians, usually native born men, and the villains are racial, religious, and cultural outsiders. And underpinning this, they argue, is an understanding of freedom from government, order, with Christian men at the top, and the necessity of violence to defend freedom and restore order. And they argue that religious nationalism merges with white nationalism. And this ties in with my scholarship on the ideological convergences between extremist groups across the religious and political spectrum. They're anti-women, anti-LGTBIQA+, anti-Semitic, anti-science, anti-government. 
And um, increasingly, um, as we're seeing, there's, there's a strong anti-Muslim uh, dimension, particularly in the US, again. It's, it's also clear in the United States that religion has not been hijacked by populists, even if it has certainly been drawn upon. Trump has proven incredibly adept at exploiting religion, for sure, and, and, he, and his election has given considerable momentum worldwide to far white supremacists, alt-right groups, but more broadly, anti-government extremism and conspiracy theorists. And that's been felt very strongly here in Australia. So as I approach the back end of the talk, um, I do want to talk about what this means at, at a global level. This perceived hierarchy has the capacity to reshape not only the United States, but the global order. Taken to its logical extreme, it constitutes rejection of the rule of law, the idea that we should be subject only to God's law and desire for the United States to reign supreme, rejection of international governing institutions, including the United Nations, because membership of which places the US as submissive to the non-Christian and non-white other, support for white evangelical missions and proselytization, as we've seen in Uganda uh, most recently, where the government uh, through funding and support from white evangelicals has outlawed homosexuality. The export of hate by newly empowered groups in the United States with no efforts to rein in or control their online activities. The export of Christian nationalist sentiment and possible funding for the growth of localised Christian nationalist movements. A permissiveness towards violence, defending the faith. And an, an increase in Christian-inspired terrorism globally and that intersection between Christian and white terrorism so here in Australia, we've experienced our first case of pre-millennial inspired terrorism at a place called William Bella. Uh, and I'm actually on the coronial investigation for that. So I can't talk too much in detail uh, about what's occurred other than to say that religion and, and Christianity played a really critical role as a mobilising force. The far right terror attack by Brenton Tarrant, um, the Christchurch terrorist, um, again, um, was inspired in many respects by this talk and this weaponization of faith and religion. Um, that I think we're going to see more of. But there's also been, critically, a refusal of the media and politicians to engage with both the Christian, Christianity, but also the whiteness of these terrorists and these attacks. And, and really what we're going to see, as I would argue, is that more people look and sound like me who are caught up in this. So as I, I'm very, very close to, to finishing, I'm aware of that. Um, thanks. So the approach is likely to be tempered only by the potential for the net personal enrichment of Trump and his family, meaning there's no contradiction in Trump engaging Saudi Arabian princes or visiting India. But in the context of other similarly religiously inspired efforts to rebuild long lost, empire, long lost empires, political and religious extremism might become the norm and a key feature of international relations. And to be provocative, um, to bring back a long lost trope, Huntington's clash of civilizations thesis, which has again long been discounted, could it in context of Christian nationalism make a comeback? So in this space, white men are very likely, I would argue, uh, the new face of religiously motivated extremism. And I think it's something we need to unpack and explore further. So I'll leave it at that, but thank you uh, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roos. Uh, so I've, I'm not going to try and summarize what uh, we're really impressive and descriptions of the challenge. I'm going to try and pose uh, a few questions to do you, Shazad, to start the conversation. And then I want to pick up some of what uh, Josh spoke about. The thing that struck me about your, your presentation of the challenge in India, the challenge in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and the challenge in uh, Sri Lanka, was that you saw the dynamics as fundamentally different. So in India, you speak about the RSS. You speak about a domestic politics, uh, which is verging on what you see as a kind of fascist politics that goes back decades to the late 20s and, and late 30s. And you speak about the assertion of that politics to the contemporary period. When you speak about Afghanistan and Pakistan, you speak about an external intervention, the CIA, and how there's an intervention to take uh, a, a, religious, uh, a religious identity of Sufism, which is based on a sense of empathy 
and not particularly militaristic and conflictual. And they politicize it in a way. And then when you go to Sri Lanka, you go back to domestic and not to external. So why, what intrigues me is, is it true that the roots of religious, the political weaponization of religion in Pakistan doesn't lie in the very nature of the partition itself? in the formulation of the society they created? And is it all the big bad CIA or are they domestic features? And in India, is it all about the bad RSS? Is there any failures by Congress itself, its own incompetence, its failure at development, its, its failure, uh, the significant amount of corruption that plagued Indian society, that alienated life. So I want to I want to force you to think through in more substantive ways in both the Indian Pakistani thing. And I was hoping to get your thoughts on that. Right. I I, I will distill it to this one concept. It's a battle of power. Whether it's religion, whether it's gender, whether you talk about any point that we're talking about throughout this talk. If you look at Afghanistan, in the end, it was about Pashtun supremacy. If you look at what's going on between, you know, various religious sects in Pakistan, it was about Sunni supremacy. If you look at Sri Lanka today, it was always about Sinhalese supremacy over the Tamils. And if you look at India, which is a much more complex space, but it does boil down to Hindu supremacy. So that is what I saw, the commonality in all these things that when we were filming, I saw that, and then you always will get a stronger group and a weaker group. Now I read somewhere that why is there no counter to Salafist supremacy in Pakistan or why there is no Congress counter of secularism? I personally feel that when we were filming, when I was in Afghanistan and we were filming with the Taliban, these people are riding the finest cars. They are armed with the finest weaponry in the world. So it boy also boils down to the kind of funding that you are facing or you have. If you look at the 80s and the 90s in Pakistan, you saw the propping up of, of, of madrasas like the Jamia Haqqaniya, where I went in. And when you go to their dining area, you realize the kind of funding that's pouring in from Saudi Arabia, from various parts of the world to these people. And when you look and go to a shrine, a Sufi shrine that celebrates poetry, that celebrates culture, they are dependent on the arms of the poor people of Pakistan who come and drop their 10 rupees and 20 rupees. So that is the battle that's going on. It is a battle of supremacy. It is a battle of who is being finest, uh, fund, who is being funded and how. So I feel that that is the core reason why when we were filming, these were the differences that we found. When it comes to the Congress and when it comes to uh, parties that are trying to sell unity and they're trying to sell cohesion and coexistence, I have found that it is much harder to sell that concept to a large mass of people. Dividing people has become easier because of the tools that you have today. You have the, the biggest dark elephant in the room is social media today. I am currently researching for my next documentary series, which is called Fact or Fiction. And if you just go on Twitter right now, you will realize if you look at the Israel-Palestine conflict, and if you go to a, the Facebook account of an Israeli, you will find the feed is completely different. And if you go to a Palestinian Facebook page, the feed is completely different. So what I call this is the weaponization through algorithms, is what our society is facing right now that we refuse to address. And so we are in a much, much darker phase of our existence. We are not looking at the Roman Empire versus the Indus Valley civilization where there was no disinformation, when, were, when people were at least honest with what, they, what their belief systems were. So I think we are in a much, much difficult position. 
and it is a battle of supremacy in the end. I'd like to close my answer with that. I hope I've addressed your question. Well, Josh, what I'm intrigued is, is to tackle the same thing, right? So I'm really understand trying to understand what's going on here. Why is this? Is so I accept that the Saudis may very well be putting money in Pakistan and that generated and gave a particular political movement that may have religious movement that may have been marginal some wings. But if you read scholars like Karen Armstrong, they speak about moments where religion, different religious traditions live in peace with each other for centuries. And that in the other, other moments, they live in conflict and they fight each other. And what she asks is why is it that in some moments they live in peace and why in other moments they are in conflict with each other? And she answers the question in, in the belief that fundamentalism arises when people feel under threat, when people under, feel under pressure. And so the question I want to pose with you about the United States or about many of these cases that you look at, you know, why is it that in a place like the United States, the Pentecostals, the churches and the white right movements congregate in the way they do, is it got to do with two provocations that I want to put to you? One is the growth of inequality in our world. So it is not striking that this all happens in a historical moment where, uh, where the global economy creates extreme disparities of wealth and poverty uh, in that context. And does that create a sense of, of an, an environment where this is enabled? The second is what you touched on, I thought, around secularism. And that is that people of religious faith, whatever that faith is, felt humiliated by the way modern society in its belief in secularism uh, related to them. That anything that was faith-based was seen as an anachronistic to modern existence, as something primitive. And that uh, secularism, the required you to be agnostic. And that sense of threat, that sense of marginalization created its own backlash. Would, do you see either of those phenomenon uh, playing a role in the rise of this Christian right that you've identified so eloquently in your, in your, in your remarks? Yeah, thanks, two excellent points. I think they go hand in hand. I think um, the in my own work, I go back in time. I ask the, the readers and, and someone to take a step back with me. And I look at that, um, that contestation between the welfare state and free market economics. And, and, and many of the, uh, the um, original scholars who were behind the welfare state and the original um, thinkers, uh, we're talking Keynes, Breveridge, were, were based in London uh, and were Christian socialists. And so, and I'm talking in the Western context here, obviously. Um, and, and those ideas that underpinned uh, that idea of a safety net for working people, uh, the role of big government, and with big government went big church, went big religion. Uh, and, and that, in many respects, is what occurred in the US as well. But then we saw the emergence uh, of the Mont Polaron Society, free market economics added to Chicago School, that became ascendant. And with free market economics, uh, there's... There's no room, there's no space for faith. There's no space for anything that interferes with the operation of the free market. And so to that extent, the free um, it goes hand in hand with a almost a militant secularism uh, where every, you know, everything uh, is pushed to the side. There's no space. So we've seen church attendance drop, particularly uh, in, in the UK, um, in, um, in Australia, in the US, in Canada, uh, drop from roughly 40 to 50% of the population down to about 10 to 12% of the population over the last 40 to 50 years since free market economics or you know, neoliberalism, as it's commonly referred to, has become the norm and become ascendant. And similarly, we've seen trade union membership drop 
from around the 50, 45 to 50 percent mark down to around 10 to 15 percent in most economies. So we've seen traditional institutions that have bound people together, that have provided them a sense of solidarity and belonging, um, you know, effectively shift. And with with that, so I think there's, an, there's a move to blame secularism, but it, it really, by, by, in particular, by these religious actors uh, who feel under threat, but it's also the church. Uh, sorry, it's also the economy. It's also the way that um, the economy has undermined people's participation in their institutions. And so they feel themselves not to be on an upward social trajectory uh, where they're able to build a movement, you know, work together and, and, and so on. They feel lost. They feel like they're not only stagnant and their numbers have placated, but they're going downhill. Here in Australia, for the very first time in our last census, uh, non-religion became uh, the largest, or non-Christianity, I should say, became the largest um, largest uh, norm. So Christianity has now dropped to less than 50% of the Australian population. And that has absolutely scared and terrified many of these leaders uh, who feel like their privileged status in society no longer exists. And so if you put that in the US context, my high migration, in particular from um, non-Christian countries, uh, high migration combined with a sense of economic impoverishment, it's no surprise that it took seven, only five to six years, I should say, for Trump to announce his uh, presidential run after the GFC. That had a long tail. I'm particularly concerned about the long tail from COVID and what that's going to entail for, for many of these movements. So I think there's a sense of decline, a sense of loss, a sense of nostalgia for that past, but also that loss of privilege, that loss of status and standing and power has really shaped um, a hard edge to many of these movements. And, and they're, they're, they're looking for advocates. They're looking for people who are going to help reinstall and politicians who are going to bring them back and make them great again. Do you, do you see an economic dimension to these uh, re-emergence of a kind of uh, hateful religious identities that have come to dominate uh, the kinds of parts of the world that you you reflect on? Look, I think that there is money to be made in hatred, for sure. There's no question about it. If you just analyze the, the, the most famous term that they use in India for uh the media that spreads hatred they're known as it's called godi media and godi is an indian word for mean the meaning is lap dog and so you have a rise in organization organizations who are completely funded by a certain political party to peddle a certain narrative if you talk about pakistan if you give me an option if i had to stay in pakistan and choose a career I would have run a Salafist madrasa because there is so much money to be made in this profession in the country that I would have definitely chosen that as a, as a career option. So uh, if you look at Afghanistan, if you look at Sri Lanka, uh, these political parties and these groups are completely running on the arms given by these political parties. So I think there is a lot of money to be made. And uh, and it's turning into an industry. And so if you, uh, there are various BJP IT cells, for example, that have propped up all over the country. And there was a recent Washington Post investigation that saw more than 150,000 people recruited just for the Karnataka elections. And now where we are heading to is the next 2024 Indian elections. And you will see the number of people that are going to be recruited. And you are talking about countries where there is high unemployment. If you look at India right now, there are more than 23,000 Indians who were caught at the US-Mexico border. That is the level of unemployment that we are talking about. There are more than 800,000 Pakistanis who are leaving Pakistan every year because their, the economies of these countries are unable to deal with this burst of population that's coming through. India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, this is maybe like this region in itself is a big part of humanity just stuck in this little neighborhood. So you're looking at a complex, uh, uh, complex issues. You're looking at an unemployment. You're looking at educational institutions who are unable to produce quality graduates. And eventually they are used as cannon fodder by these hate groups and extremist groups. I was filming in the in uh, two hours away from, uh, at, uh, from Atlanta and this 
group uh, was a white supremacist group called the Three Percenters, who believed that the three percent of U.S. white nationalists were the ones who fought for the freedom of America. And these guys were armed to the teeth. They had some of the finest weaponry I have ever seen in my life. So eventually, these groups do receive funding. If you look at Hindutva groups in India, if you look at Bajrang Dal, if you look at VHP, if you look at the Sangh Parivar, they get funding from Indian Americans living in India. So there is definitely a lot of money to be made. And I think that is where we are losing the battle of coexistence. Yeah. Two quick questions. I, I want to say to the audience that I am going to move to the audience in, in a couple of minutes, but I have two questions, both for Shazad and Josh, uh, in rapid succession. And I'm hoping you both will, will uh, give me your thoughts on both. The first is in both questions, in, in both your reflections, you speak a lot about the mobilization of the right by actors in the right, whether it's conservatives in the religious movements, whether it's political populists and how they, they begin to see a coincidence of interests. The question is, in all of these societies, we also have what I would call broadly progressive people, people of social democratic inclination, people who believe in empathy, people who believe in the human community coming together, people who believe in religions, identities can coexist without having to kill each other. And in all of these societies for long periods of time, those people were in the ascendant. So the question is, are they doing something wrong and not simply the bad, the bad people doing something right? That's the question. You know, even in the United States, Josh, the Democrats have come to power. There are people, progressives at various levels. There was an Obama. There is a Biden. There was others. And, you know, Congress was in power in India. There is, uh, there was Bolsonaro in Brazil, but so was there Lula in Brazil. And so the question I want to ask is instead of blaming where we are simply on the right, what is, the prog what is it that progressives are doing wrong? What is the agency in this failure of ours? And I wanted to force you to ask and reflect on your own comrades, I would presume, and say, what they are they doing wrong that allows them to fail so spectacularly every single time? Maybe I should start with you, Josh. And then I'll come to you, Cheza. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, you flipped that on its head. Um, I, I think it, it's about the emotional um, tone of the epoch uh, and the era that we find ourselves in, in many respects. Uh, emotion plays a critical role. What was Obama able to mobilise? What was Biden? And, and, and what have progressive leaders been able to do best? It's to mobilise hope. They run positive campaigns about the future and inclusion. And what do, what do the uh, right in particular focus on? They focus on fear and negativity. Now, we have faced over the last um, two decades uh, in the context of 9-11, the war on terror, uh, an era, a political era, in which the tabloid media and the right-wing governments around the world have managed to mobilise that fear consistently, vigorously, and pursue that and to, and to create a sense of, a small-minded thinking around protection of ourselves at all costs. And I think in that sense, um, what uh, that, that fear has been able to do is to overcome any chance of hope. But that goes hand in hand with downward social trajectories. The cost of a house in any major Western city nowadays has oh, probably more than trebled. Uh, housing is increasingly unaffordable. We have a cost of living crisis. Interest rates have gone through the roof. People are so focused on themselves, uh, that attempting to put something big and progressive on the agenda, like the voice uh, to parliament referendum we're facing here in Australia, which had widespread support, widespread support in the early polling, will probably not get up because it's the worst possible time to try to bring something that it requires hope and inspiration and big picture thinking. 
uh, where we're just coming out of a pandemic, we've had 14 straight interest rises coinciding with the, the vote. So I, I think hope versus fear. But I also think the role of social media is being critical and um, potentially overlooked. Social media is a mobilising force. And I would say in many respects, uh, those who feel themselves alienated, fearful and angry, um, far more effective actors online in spreading and creating that fear and that sense of conspiracy and, and, and that deep, deep existential angst than progressives are at spreading hope online. Shazad? I think as a member of the left, we are to blame for a number of things that we are not doing right. And what the right wing is doing is the right wing is very organized. The right wing is well funded. The right wing is motivated in what they believe in. And even though if you look at all these countries that we've talked about, the right wing is the minority, yet they are noisy, yet they are more vocal. On the other hand, I feel that the left wing, while I've lived my life under President Obama's election campaign, and while I've lived a certain portion of my life under the semi-left Imran Khan in Pakistan, or I've seen Congress uh, members fighting elections in India, I think there is a level of lack of motivation in what they believe in. I think then again, what Josh said about social media, if you can just do a little experiment and post something negative online and see how it goes viral versus saying something positive and something about cohesion and it doesn't get the traction. So I think as we are in this world where children are literally growing up in the digital age, we have to give importance to how these algorithms have created a monster, created a right-wing monster for various societies that we are unable to fight against. The left has, a, has not been able to come up with a strategy to analyze what they're doing wrong even. And I feel that there is a greater level of conversion happening from people from the left wing going to the right wing. That is another big threat that we're not talking about. Let, leave, leave alone the idea that we are, are we can coexist and the majority of the people love peace and love harmony. The right wing is radicalizing the left right now. And that is something that's happening all over our societies. I know wonderful friends who joined the Taliban. I They are my friends who used to go out and party with me and live a very secular life. Eventually ended up joining the Taliban. They joined the jihad in Afghanistan. I know a number of friends who live in Singapore, one of the most secular, one of the most uh, wonderful country that you can coexist in. All religions live in harmony. And I have been kicked out of uh, homes because I, I said a certain thing that did not they did not agree with. And they believed in the propaganda that they were uh, getting from various social media outlets. So Do I you, think that's what we yeah. are. So, I mean, I'd, I'd like to ask you, you know, from in my country, uh, one of the things that Nelson Mandela used to say um, is that if you want to fundamentally change a society, you don't need to only speak to your own people. You need to speak to the opposite side and shift them. Uh, now, you can't shift all of them, but you may be able to shift some of them. And... Um, that, in many ways, was the real uh, wisdom of, 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 of Nelson Mandela. And the question I must ask is whether progressives have forgotten that. They've become so used to their own echo chamber and having to agree with people that they, that whose values they share, that they've forgotten to respect others and try to shift others to another worldview or to at least a coexistence. And I wonder whether we should ask progressives whether we're doing enough of that. What would you think, Shazan? And I'll come to you in a minute, Josh. I completely agree with you because there's a definite demonization of the right wing. And I feel it started with the whole Donald Trump phenomena in the United States and how the right wing were dumb people who did not understand the complexities of the world. And so I think that they, that is definitely correct. If you look at any part of the world, the right wing has always been demonized and the left has not reached out to them. They, that has definitely not happened in the Islamic world, as I say. 
the 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 secular muslims who are living in south africa in pakistan have never made an attempt to go to these madrasas and address and share what they think is right and bring them towards what they feel should be how coexistence should go ahead so i think that there is definitely uh, an agreement there uh, having said that you are also dealing with a right wing that's violent and you are dealing with two different groups of people one that does not believe in violence versus a group that does so how the question arises is how do you address a group of violent believers or a people who use violence to propagate their cause so it's definitely a challenge josh any thoughts on that I, I agree entirely. I think um, I, I, frame, I consider myself progressive for the most part. Um, and I think that uh, really what we see from the political left, um, particularly activists, is a condemnation, a blanket condemnation and an inability uh, to even um, <clears throat> attempt to engage. And, and what that then creates is almost a full circle where you've got two hard edges butting up against each other with most people somewhere in the middle. I think most people can be reached, but I think that, as you were saying, um, Shazad, the um, that that hard right, the violent right, I think that requires something different. Uh, but I think it requires, um, and this goes to one of the questions in the uh, the chat um, around um, producing counter propagandization. Uh, well, for me, it's uh, about counter narratives. Sorry, ra rather than counter narratives, it's about alternative narratives. Rather than telling someone you're wrong, and here's why is the truth you you can offer them um, alternative trajectories um, you 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 equip them you give them agency to explore new paths um, and 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 that's a it's a real uh, process and it takes a lot of skill uh, and a lot of effort but I think the rewards there are potentially far greater so I want to come to questions that uh, people or the audience who are listening to you have actually posed and I've got a couple that I would like to go through uh, Josh, there is an interesting question that goes, given that religion has always been a civilizing instrument and used by politics and power actors, we've always had people, ethnic or religious entrepreneurs, trying to mobilize for political power. What is the difference today that allows them to be far more effective than on previous occasions? You know, why is it, in Shazad's terms, the RLSS is successful today when it wasn't in the 1930, late 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and, and other periods. What is it about this historical moment that drives this? Any thoughts, Josh? Uh, look, I, I think it comes down in many respects. These are transnational movements. These are movements that are organised online. These are movements that are talking to one another, engaging, building momentum, uh, resourcing each other. Uh, and I think in many respects, it's the internet, it's technology, it's the um, technological affordances um, of, of social media that equip these groups um, with a, a, a level of organisation that they never had before that helps them build momentum. I think it ties in to economic decline and a stripping of citizenship and in our institutions in wider society. And I think that that's created that perfect storm. People feel dislocated, alienated, angry. There's a lack of institutional support for them. Where do you go? You go online and you find solace and community online. And I think that's what's given these groups far more momentum than they've ever had. So, I mean, there's a second question and really it's, it's directed to Shazad, but I think both of you might have an interest in this. Shazad, one of our members of our audience has kicked off by suggesting that, you know, religion in its traditional sense is in decline in many societies. Uh, at least religious observance of the rituals that play out. Um, um, uh, and it's particularly declining in wealthy societies, in societies with high level, high welfare states. Um, why? What? How would you see that? Do you think, you know, if the welfare will save you, why bother with God, in a sense? Why do you think that's an answer? Uh, enable high levels of social democracy in places like Pakistan and India and Afghanistan and Sri Lanka. Uh, I'm imagining 
that we did have that in the United States, or at least some version of it, and it didn't work. Do you think that's an answer? I think that if you look at the 1940s and 50s and you look at the kind of leadership that you had, you had Muhammad Ali Jinnah on one end, a liberal, secular, forward-looking, uh, progressive, le Islamic leader. On the other hand, you had Mohandas, Karamchand Gandhi, you had Nehru, who were progressive, who, were, who believed in the coexistence. But since then, there's been a steady decline. One of the questions uh, talked about the rise of the Islamic movement in Iran. And I think that sort of coincides with the rise of General Ziaul Haq in Pakistan, that coincides with uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. So I feel that there was a failure of this particular leadership in the 1940s and 50s and economic failures of Jinnah, of Nehru, that resulted in what Dr. Josh mentioned, is that going and taking solace in religion or leaders who proposed that you follow me, you follow this particular brand of Islam and your economics will improve. So if you look at the speeches, I personally interviewed uh, Lashkar-e Taiba chief, um, who was the mastermind of the Mumbai attacks. And he was addressing a group of farmers in Punjab. And all he talked about was economics. And that is something that our secular leadership right now has been unable to understand. That economics is at the center, the heart of radicalization of these groups. The Hindus are being promised that they will get better jobs if they support the RSS and the BJP's agenda. So in the end, uh, I think it boils down to how much food do I have on the table? And if you don't have food on the table and you have nothing to lose, then you will go and believe in any fairy tale there is out there to believe. And right now, if you look at Afghanistan, they are now realizing the price for bringing in the Taliban. During the last 20 years, during the last 20 years, you meet an Afghan and they would always mention that things were better under the Taliban and that the Ashraf Ghani government has given us nothing. But And that was the reason why it took the Taliban seven to eight days to run over the Afghan National Army. And now they're realizing that that wasn't the case, that economics is a completely different monster than supporting the Taliban and bringing in these people who will bring peace and who will bring equality in the system. So I think it's a much more complex world that we live in today. Uh, Josh, I would like to come back to you on the same thing, but I'd like to ask you as you think that and answer that question. Um, you know, what is interesting in a place like the UK is we've had these Leicester riots uh, and many of the people involved in the riots were second generation, sometimes even third generation, uh, British men and women, yes, of Hindu background or Muslim background. Uh, but what makes a second generation or third generation Hindu or Muslim in Britain who's grew up in a broadly pluralistic and democratic society want to repel those pluralist and democratic gains and act in ways that are so narrowly chauvinist and religiously chauvinist. How would you explain that as you think through what Shazad's responses? Yeah, look, I've done a lot of work on Muslim communities. So are you talking to me or to Shazad? No, I'm talking to you, Josh. Oh, yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, yeah, so I've done a lot of work on Muslim communities in Western contexts um, and a, a lot of work with second and third generation young Muslim men and women. And what I think differentiates them significantly from their parents is that uh, their parents um, came to the Western context, to the US or in particular Australia, the UK, Canada, looking for a better life. And, and they're focused purely on uh, almost completely immersing themselves in local culture and, and, and building a better life, building small businesses and, and so on. Um, second and third generation, and Kassan Haj talks about this, he's a prominent philosopher here in Australia, he talks about this process of misinterpolation so he's drawing on other philosophical streams. And, and what he talks about here is this, idea, this process of shattering. You're told that you fit in. You're told you belong. You're told you're Australian or British or Canadian until you're not, until you start to experience that structural systemic inequality and discrimination. And as you face that, as you 
as you start to realise, actually, I'm not really British. I'm not really Australian in the eyes of the media, the government, um, the, the key institutions. Well, they, they find solace. Um, and so Islam, Hinduism, uh, other faiths become an identity marker and a, sen a, a sense of belonging and solidarity that they're otherwise lacking. And so in that, in that environment, um, there's, there's um, a level of emotion, a sense of shame, humiliation, resentment, and that can be mobilised quite radically and quite readily by extreme sentiment. So what I want to come back to is three questions that are posed by members of our audience, and I think all are really central, but you've touched on. One uh, is, is there a need uh, for public ownership of social media platforms? You know, Shazad, you spoke about social media and its, and its negative impact. Josh, you touched on it. Do you think we should be speaking about the nationalization of social media platforms and their regulation in a much more rigorous way? Or do you think that's a step too far? Uh, Shazad. Obviously, there is a question between free speech and my right to say whatever I want to say versus regulation. And I find that what's going on on Twitter right now and how we've seen the democratization of Twitter, where the right wing extremist elements uh, have, the, uh, have the right to create their account and spread propaganda as much as the left wing does. And that's what the current leadership of Twitter believes in. Uh, versus you you come up with a, a, a online space where everyone uh, ha, free everyone's free speech is regulated. But what's happening is that many people have now stopped believing in the power of social media and they've now created their own ego chambers. You have telegram groups run by the Taliban who propagate their agenda. And if you agree with their point of view, you join that particular group. On Facebook, you have closed groups that only believe in a certain narrative. So I think that the weaponization of social media has gone to an extent where these extreme groups are creating their own social media groups, their own social media in a way. So I think that the question has gone far beyond that now as to how to re-engage these extreme groups and bring them back to one common social media now. And um, I think that it's a very, very big challenge. And I think people sitting in San Francisco uh, who are designing these tools have to come up with an answer. I don't think that activists or academics will have an answer to these uh, popular tools. And now it's, it's becoming pretty extreme where uh, you on these social media outlets, you can have enjoy the freedom to disseminate gory videos, you have the freedom to spread anything, really, and create any narrative that you want to. And it doesn't have to do with facts at all. Josh? Um, in, in terms of uh, nationalisation, I don't think it would be trusted by extremist groups or anyone who's got any form of anti-government leaning. Um, it's a great idea. It's, it's, it's optimistic. But uh, I, I've, had, I've, I've sat in Senate committees where... You've had politicians there talking tough about regulation of social media companies. And yet yeah, we know this, we're talking about algorithmic radicalization. We really want to hit these echo chambers. We're sick of the lack of uh, action by Meta and other groups. And then the, they, they go in the room with them, they they fall, they become they fall to water. They they just fall apart. They refuse to confront them because these companies have enormous power. Uh, and so, unfortunately, I, I think we're in this process where regulation continues to be a significant challenge. Um, but I do think, again, uh, the point of bringing everyone together, I think that if more work could be done, um, Twitter's just become a cesspool of hate over the last uh, last few months um, because of the unadulterated flow. I think you find that balance of regulation, but also um, uh, allowing people to have extreme views um, without crossing over into violent extremism where you harm and threaten and intimidate and harass others. I think we can find that balance. We can start to move forward. I mean, that raises an interesting question because it dovetails neatly with the question that has been posed by one of our viewers. And what they have suggested is asked a much more proactive question rather than on social media. What they're saying is, how would you create spaces for engagement in polarized societies? How do you make 
people who are in these polarized camps in very polarized societies start talking to each other so that we get away from the echo chambers. We allow uh, people in different religious camps and others to start talking. What are the kinds of ways to enable uh, engagement across the, the divides that, that seem to, is there any thoughts that either of you have? Ross, Josh, you want to kick off here? Um, yeah, thanks. I, I, a critical component of this, I think, is coming back to face-to-face -to -face communication. One of the, the primary issues around uh, online activism and, and behaviour is anonymity, disinhibition. People, um, you, you can act online in a way you would never act face-to-face. -face. You can yell, abuse, harass, threaten people. You wouldn't do that in the street, you'd be arrested. Face-to-face uh, -face interaction requires a level of civility, but it also requires a level of humanisation. You're not just speaking to a, um, an avatar, a, a fake profile, you're speaking to a person. And I think a big part of where we need to move forward is because I think the social media technology has gone so far above and beyond the human brain and what we're actually capable of dealing with as a collectively as a society. I think we need to bring it back to community and to face-to-face -face engagement. And I think you, you take that and that's probably your first step. Shazad? No, I, I, I agree because I think that there is a rise in interfaith harmony groups in Pakistan that I've never seen in my life before, where uh, there are guided tours that are taking place and financed by various a, a agencies and embassies in the country, where uh, Sunni groups are taken or school uh, children are being taken to a Hindu temple in Pakistan, and so I think it boils down to the curriculum uh, that you are raising a generation that is learning about hatred on social media, but how do you counter it? You counter it in schools. You counter it, uh, like Josh said, on a face-to-face -face basis. And But on the other hand, you, you have a right wing that's way too clever and way too smart, and it's outsmarted the left a long, long time ago. And you see that it's happening in India right now, that they're revising the curriculum. That is one of the most dangerous things that are happening in India right now. They're inculcating RSS hatred in school education. That there was this one chance that they could regain a secular India from the grassroots and they countered that as well. And if you look at Pakistan, they've invented laws even in India, they've invented the love jihad law. For example, in Uttar Pradesh, that if you are if you are a Muslim and you want to marry a Hindu, you can't. You will be jailed because you broke the law. In Pakistan, for example, if you try to enter an Ahmadi mosque, for instance, you can be there can be a blasphemy case filed against you because you're a Sunni Muslim. You can't enter a mosque. You can't call it a mosque. So the we. <laughs> The society. I mean, by the way, what that sounds like is apartheid South Africa. In many ways, yes. those were elements of apartheid South Africa. Correct, correct. You've got those laws. You've got the uh, laws from uh, Southern uh, America in the 40s and 50s. So those are the grim, those are the delicate situations that the left is facing right now. When you have to counter them, you have to engage with all these discriminatory laws that the right wing has spread in your uh, in your path. One more important question, because at one level, if I listen to both of you, I'm utterly depressed because it seems like the world is should is ending and we all uh, uh, put a hiding to nothing. Oh, is there a future? And what is the possibilities of a more humane world, a better world? Are we saying that that world is gone forever? Or are we saying that we need to do certain things towards that world. And I'd like to get both your thoughts in that. I, I presume you do not want all of our viewers to go home utterly depressed. Uh, let's start with you, Josh, again. Um, look, uh, I think I'd give the caveat to a lot of my talks and, and engagement with the wider public to say, look, I focus on the dark and the dirty <laughs> and I don't want you to go away feeling terrible about this because I am looking at a small percentage of, of actors here. Um, I think there's, there's cause for considerable optimism and hope. We had a global pandemic. Uh, 
we had millions of deaths, but in that in that context, we've also had enormous scientific progress. We've managed to emerge out of that. We're rebuilding our economy. We're rebuilding our societies. People are starting to talk to each other again face-to-face and engage. And I think there's enormous power in that. And I think there's enormous power in learning from the mistakes of the past and, and, and moving forward. I think social media, as I've said, we've had to catch up to where we're actually starting to get our head around what that means. And I think uh, in many respects, people are starting to look and, and create their own communities that counter a lot of the hate. I think people are fed up with hate. I think people are fed up with polarization. So I'm actually optimistic about where we go as, as not just as individual societies, but globally. And I think the, the issue of having to address catastrophic existential threat of climate change, I actually think in that context, societies must talk together must cooperate and we've seen that albeit fragmented we're starting to see it more and more so i'm positive and optimistic as much as i focus on the ugly and 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 the uh the horrible is that i think i think nature is the most powerful tool on this planet and i think it's decided to bring us together if you come to south america and bogota where i am right now and you see the lines of people who have no food and who have no jobs and they're all marching towards the United States right now through the Darien Gap. And there is no nationality, no religion. They don't have, they don't believe in any of the differences. All they believe in is is reaching to the United States in one piece for better economic prospects for a better future. So I think that climate change, as Josh said, is going to bring us together in the end because we are facing a very bleak uh, we are facing a time where eight to nine billion people will not know where their food supplies are going to come through. So I think in the end, I think Mother Nature is going to decide and is going to bring us together. As you see the people in the Darien Gap, they're all together. They're Afghans, they're Chinese, they're Ecuadorians, they're Colombians. They're all together in in this battle against inequality, injustice. So I think there is hope. There is in uh, there is a hope for the future, and I am positive that you know eventually climate change is going to decide how we are going to deal with this hatred that's uh, prevalent all over this this wonderful world of ours. I have to. I mean, it's an interesting question, um, but I have to push back in one sense, both to you, Shazad, and Josh. Both of you raise climate change, and at one level, I I entirely agree. At another. I worry that the North and the South have not cut a deal. You know, there is these debates that it always fractures on the socialist just, on not the socialist, but the socially just transition. And how do you make and align what is the need to address climate change and speak to the immediate needs of poor people in the middle of the Congo Basin? You can tell the person in the Congo Basin, don't cut the trees because the planet needs it. But if he's got, he or she's got to cut the tree so that they can heat, they can have fire because there's no energy and feed their children, uh, they're not going to worry about what's 50 years or 100 years from now. They have to feed their children. How do we get that alignment together? Have you, either of you got a thought? Josh. Yeah, um, look, I'm being located in Australia um, and and obviously with the Pacific Ocean at our doorstep, those countries that are most impacted, facing that existential threat to their very um, future, like the fact that they could well, just due to rises in ocean levels, be wiped off the map, um, is is really cause for con- like incredible concern in this part of the world. And uh, the Australian government, um, I think we're, we're seeing this interesting sort of shift. Um, our our um, right-wing conservative uh, ministers were caught laughing at this um, on camera only five to ten years ago. I don't remember exactly when. And it was it was quite embarrassing, oh, incredibly embarrassing and humiliating to, to know that they were laughing about this. But what's happened in more recent times, particularly with the change of government, is that we're not only understanding um, and, and seeking to 
ensure that these um, countries feel safe, feel secure, whatever it takes to keep them um, afloat, whatever we need to do as a country to work with them. And a big part of that is the the great power challenges in our region. Um, China are going in there and, and spending hundreds of millions of dollars and Australia and, and the Western context can't, can't counter that. And so there's this com- competition and, and one way and, and that's being expressed is through climate change. And I think that's actually in some ways working to their favour. Um, we're investing considerable resources into ensuring their sustainability and ongoing. We're bringing Is them it, in, working economically with them. Thanks, Josh. Shazad, one minute on for your thoughts. Frankly, Adam, I would much rather be divided between the North and the South as against being divided between religion, race, Hinduism, Muslim, Buddhism. I'm, I'm done with that. So I'd much rather choose the North and the South division, which is pretty clear. And I also believe that climate change will reach everyone in the end. It will not spare anyone. And so I feel that there is a higher chance that we will gather together and fight against it rather than be able to come up with a solution for the religious bigotry and hatred that's going on in the world right now. So ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, it's this is a lovely point to, to begin to come to an end to the conversation. Perhaps the optimism lies in three things, it seems to me, uh, from what I've heard in this conversation. The first is climate change and the challenges of our world are going to force us to come together. Uh, migration the, is a, a feature of our lives and you can station as many troops and as many naval vessels as you want in the Panama Canal or in the Mediterranean, people are coming through. And as they come through, they fundamentally change our societies and they evolve our societies. And in that presence, we come to know each other. We come to engage each other. We come to, to be with each other. And, and that changes us and creates at least the structural conditions for a more, for a greater sense of humanity and empathy. The second is we need to learn to talk to each other and we need to learn to talk to divides. It's an old Nelson Mandela uh, advice, political advice. You you can speak to your comrades as much as you want, but the day you begin to transform society is when you learn to speak to the people who are not your comrades, to learn to win them over, to craft with them a common political project a common human project. And then it seems to me the third, and perhaps as important, is how we move towards a humane economic system. One that is less defined by extremes of billionaires on the one hand, and people can't put food on their tables on the other. And only when those three things come together in a conversation, uh, come together in a way that aligns, that's when we create the conditions for a more humane, empathetic world. Um, On that basis, I want to thank, of course, Josh and Shazad for your wonderful comments, for for the fact that I think, Josh, you woke up right in the middle of the night. I'm sorry about that. Shazad, I think you're right in the morning, I would imagine. Uh, (laughs) And colleagues, to all of you around the world, um, thank you for joining us. We will be having many of these in the coming months, these director's lecture series on the great challenges of our time and how to think through solutions to those challenges. You are central to us thinking through these things. And so I want to thank the audience from around the world and I look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you very, very much.